All right, I've started recording, so hopefully this entire discussion will also be recorded, so whatever you type, I can send you the recording as well, and you'll oh, have great. both, maybe? Maybe that will? That'd be great. Okay. <laughs> well, All then right. I won't even type. I'll just listen. Okay. All right. So what, what then I like to do then is to make sure that for every master facility, and a master facility is just a dummy account, it's, it's our organizational structure. So when there are multiple facilities, imaging facilities, that will be submitting data to the NRDR, and the NRDR is the National Radiology Data Registry. It's just a name that we've given ourselves, and it's a broad name that includes six separate databases. So in this instance, we're talking about the DIR, the dose index registry. So that's one of our six databases. So the NRDR, um, we try to make sure all the facilities are registered appropriately. So there's one master account and then all the imaging facilities submitting true images to the NRDR um, have their images uh, uh, sorting through the master. This is only for DIR. It's the, it's the only exception to all our databases. Um, and then at that point, the, the data is then copied and then distributed per scanner into the um, child facility ID that represents where that scanner exists in a physical location. Um, and then the second thing, and this is when I bring in my uh, tech support, is to make sure that all the scanners at the triad installation, and I'll explain what that is in a minute, um, are then mapped to the correct child facility ID. And every child facility ID represents one imaging location. So it's an actual address. So the ID doesn't represent a scanner, because there can be more than one scanner at an imaging location. So if it's one scanner or if it's five at one location, it's still one facility ID. So, okay. um, right, right. So I get that question a lot too. Does the ID uh, have a relationship with the scanner or is it a relationship with the actual imaging facility? And it is indeed the imaging facility, its actual location, its address on okay. the map. So um, for the DIR, um, what we need then is for each scanner to be submitting an RDSR, which is a dose structured report, along with a localizer. Sometimes localizers are called topograms or um, scouts, depending on which manufacturer you're using. So sending um, an RDSR plus a localizer in an automated fashion to the triad server. This is already happening, and I know it's happening because I've been checking the data for with Mark Feely, so I know there's data coming across. The only thing that we are limited by at the triad server is because the triad server is actually a listener and it receives data, meaning um, the data has to be pushed to it. It doesn't pull data. It receives data that is pushed. So the data is either pushed from the scanner to a PAX and then from the PAX to the triad or directly from the scanner to the triad. Um, those are already set up and when there is um, a discussion that's going back and forth like between us and, and Mark recently, it's usually based on which scanner is sending. Um, and if a particular scanner has stopped sending, that's the only thing the triad server can't do is distinguish when an, a, a scanner has stopped uh, sending. We, right, so if there's five scanners at one facility ID and four are sending, then the, the server is listening and, and receiving that data and it acknowledges according to the software code, hey, it's getting data, everything's in good shape. So that's why we issue um, every quarter a data quality um, notice which um, alerts our end users such as yourself to go in and take a look at your data to make sure that if indeed you do have five scanners are all scanners sending data? Um, 
again, because the triad won't alert you if, if we're missing one scanner's data. It's really just listening for any data. Um, so, so far, Mark and us, um, including Stephanie, we've been doing all right going back back and forth trying to, I think, untangle a few um, questions that really kind of go beyond the data quality check. And the most recent one that he asked was, um, it, it was more really um, an alert to me. Um, we have, he stated, um, that he doesn't see his current scanners, which means I have to bring my tech support in and get them involved. Um, we'll address that in a second. But he also stated that, uh, something secondary, which is um, the following, one, two, three, four, scanners seem to be duplicates, two are duplicates, why are these duplicates here? Um, to explain a duplicate representation of a scanner, not a duplicate exam, or duplicate data, but just looking at the scanner, we use four scanner ID fields. And if one of those variables within those fields changes, the triad server, the code that's written there, will recognize that as an entirely separate scanner. So all four data fields, and we do pull those from the DICOM header. I can send you a link to the um, the data fields that we collect from the DICOM header, if you're familiar with the header, you'll, you'll know that it, it exists. Uh, each data field has um, an, an eight-digit tag, and it's a numeric tag. And so those numeric tags are what we've used in our program language so that our triad can then pull the data from that tag and then populate it into our central server. So. Of those four particular fields, if any one of them changes, um, then the triad alerts you and us that there's a new scanner. Well, maybe it's really not a new scanner. What's probably happened, and this is what's most common, there's a station ID name that can be changed. Uh, usually the scanner model, the scanner manufacturer um, are never changed. They, they remain as they are, usually from when you receive the scanner from the manufacturer. So those two data fields we collect, and they don't really change. But the two data fields that do change would be what's called station ID, and also um, station, uh, uh, scanner institution name. So once you get your scanner, and perhaps it's over at uh, Westminster, and you, you want your scanner to, to be a little bit more unique, your field engineer may type in to that data field the institution name as Westminster, for example. Uh, so if that field ever changes, that alerts the triad, it's a new scanner. Um, usually that field does not change. Once it's established, it usually stays that way unless the scanner is decommissioned or moved. Um, the fourth data field, and this one changes very often, um, mainly because um, field engineers, when they come in, usually once to twice a year, they may do an upgrade or simply an update. Date. So they come in, reconfigure, and when they reconfigure, they usually rename that data field. That's what comes across usually once to twice a year, and we get this common question, hey, this is really the same scanner. It's not a fifth scanner or a sixth one. It's the same one. Um, again, the software code can't recognize that is the same one. It's because one of the data fields has been altered. So I'm kind of wanting to tell you that up front so that moving forward, knowing that any of your locations, if any of those scanners do receive even a software upgrade, and a, there's been a lot of upgrades lately, especially with the XR29 um, compliance, 
requirements. Um, a lot of these are taking place. So we're getting a lot of these phone calls. Um, so what I can say <laughs> is though, even though it's a little bit annoying, the heat will die down. All of your scanners will eventually get that upgrade. It will show up in your data and you will become accustomed to seeing it. Here's where there's a slight difference. Um, that new scanner name has to be remapped at the triad installation. That's probably something you're not going to do. I'm going to guess you probably have a PAX administrator or, right, right. right. Perfect. Your PAX administrator is most likely the one that's going to log into the triad server. Um, he or she would have what we call um, administrative privileges. So with administrative privileges, that person can log in, reassign that um, unmatched scanner name to the correct facility ID, and then you're done. You don't have to do anything with it again unless there's another upgrade a year from now, and then you, you, you just do the same thing a year from now. You just remap it. Um, and then you're done. Um, as far as the existence of the older name of the scanner, it doesn't disappear. And, and we do get that complaint every now and again from facilities, especially when they have a lot of scanners. Uh, they're looking at old scanner names and new scanner names. The old scanner name doesn't disappear. It doesn't uh, fall off the screen or fall off our radar or even from view from what I call a scanner bay. There's a, a window where all of the scanner identification fields appear and it looks like a menagerie of just collected names over a period of years. But the reason why they're there is because that particular scanner name is linked to historical data. And the only thing we really can do, and our developers are working on some sort of solution, is to bump those older scanner names to the bottom of the list so that the more current scanners sending data appear at the top of the list in that scanner bay or that scanner window where those names are listed. So. Um, I really wanted to preempt that with you too because that was an outstanding question that Mark and I were um, where we left off. You know, why is this here? What's going to happen with this uh, older name? Do we really have to look at it? Yeah, you have to look at it, <laughs> but okay. but it's older data, and as it becomes older and older over time because of the new scanner names going to be replacing it with lots and lots and lots of data for 2017. Um, it's not a scanner that you'll be looking at constantly, maybe for a little while, but then after a while, it just, uh, it, it's less important and, um, it, and it, it's less dominant, I think, mm -hmm. when, when, when looking at data. So it, our developers haven't quite figured out a way to bump those to the bottom, the ones that are historical, um, but they, they do continue to look into a method that might be pleasing to facilities that do actually have a lot of scanners and those scanners do go through upgrades or at least updates, usually once a year. So that can be kind of cumbersome, I know, for the, the larger facilities. I want to stop since I've been talking for a good solid 15 minutes and ask you any, do you have any burning questions at the moment? Um, well, first, um, when, when you said that if we have five scanners and only four of them work, um, will the last, will the fifth one be able to create the information or have we lost it completely? All right. If, if the scanner is no longer sending or if it's a, a new scanner and it has never been able to successfully send, which means going from the scanner to the triad to the central server. Once it's at the central server, that's easy. We just parse it right into the, the facility ID. So 
those are three stops. Um, if that scanner has not been able to submit any data at all, or has stopped submitting data for a prolonged period of time, we usually start um, a troubleshooting addressing two different things. One is usually fairly easy. I generally refer a participant or a facility to contact their uh, manufacturer of that scanner, get in touch with the field engineer, and check the configurations. I don't know if your PACS administrator is quite savvy with the scanners. Sometimes they're not. Um, so if you don't have anyone on premises that doesn't work directly with configuring the scanners, the next person in line is the field engineer. Um, contact that individual, have them come out and assess whether or not the scanner is indeed sending an RDSR instead of a dose page. Um, a dose page of the secondary capture is a little less reliable. We do work with secondary captures, but we, we prefer the RDSR, the dose structured report. Um, if the configuration is set up correctly and the field engineer has done his or her job, then we have to figure out what might be failing at the triad. And that's when our help desk comes in and they begin to troubleshoot. They look at failed files. They, they look at an awful lot of things, study instance UIDs. They're, they're really trying to assess if data is reaching the triad, um, what is happening at the triad. There could be a few things, um, and I'll leave it up to them to to go through that troubleshooting um, scenario because they, they truly do have to make it specific to uh, the manufacturer. We do have protocols that we use um, because we know that some scanners work very differently than others and we've gotten used to that. Um, if it's not failing at the triad, then it might be failing at the central server, which is a little less, actually it's very less common, but there are reasons why it could fail. Um, and that's when we escalate the ticket, and it usually goes to a fellow named Chow, um, and he works at that level. He works with data that's actually already made it from the triad. Or, or at least to the triad, either it's stuck there or it's made it on through to the central server and, and then is stuck there for some reason. Um, so that's how we escalate tickets. Is there a particular scanner currently, uh, and it sounded like from Mark there might be two, but I could be wrong, where, let's see, he says, I don't see our newest scanners. He, put an S in there as though it were more than one. I'm reaching out to our IT to be sure the data is getting to the triad server. Um, hmm. Now he didn't let me know which, you know, what type of of scanner that was. So I, I'm not sure the type, uh, the manufacturer, the the model or whatnot, and I, and I don't know if it's now currently coming through. Do you know which of those two scanners might he might have been referring to? No, I have to familiarize myself with okay. um, with everything. I'm um, this is uh, new. <laughs> it's right, right. It is, yes, it is, and I tell you, um, I can walk you through a lot of it. Our triad team will then walk you through the rest of it, um, and it is a learning process. So we can go over this as many times as you like, especially since you're being sort of thrown into the middle and. Things have already just, yeah. yeah, they're on their way. All right, so one of the, in the email, I'm sorry, not the email, the, the invitation that I sent out for you and I to have our meeting, I usually put in um, email history because I, I like to look back through the history without it getting lost amongst all my other email. Um, it looks to me like there are about 10, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine, nine scanners currently submitting data. Mm -hmm. um, do you know how many scanners you have in all? No. 
Okay. <laughs> All right, that'll be good for you. Uh, no. Yeah, I think it might be. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, I need to uh, get myself familiarized, like I said. Okay. What I can so. do in the meantime is, I, th I think I'll do two things. Is What I'll do is I'll pull a list of the Master Child Facility IDs just to make sure that they match with what you have and send it to you. So pull a list of Master Child IDs. And then the second thing I'll do is I'll run another query um, for the last month and see if the scanners have changed, if we've received data from a new scanner. Since I, you know, pulled a list, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, this list is from, okay, May 11th, okay, so it's been a couple of weeks, you know, two and a half, one and a half. Um, it is entirely possible that a scanner is now successfully sending, so what I can do is run a scanner query and see if there are additional, you know, scanners, mm -hmm. and I will email that to you, two additional okay. scanners, question mark. Um, and then the third thing is how to get you added as a user, so how to add Lainey as user. I, okay. I also don't have um, a list, I have a list of the doctor's NPI numbers, right. but I don't I don't have the doctors in there, and I need to be able to. Okay. Um, uh, so there are like four of them that mm -hmm. are already. Okay. Um, on there, I'm not sure how that worked. But, okay, um, so I, it's you know I can send you the instructions for what's called um, manage physicians. It's it's a place on the. Uh, Yes, it's a when you log into any of your facilities, and because you have several, I would suggest using a template, and then we can assist you with uploading that template repeatedly. Sometimes that's faster than logging in, upload it, log out, and then log into the next, upload it, and log out, and so on and so on and so on. Um, what we can do is I can send you the managed physicians um, Excel spreadsheet. Um, okay, and if you would uh, just complete it and then send it back to me, I can then upload it to all of your oh. facilities. And it's pretty quick for you. I think it might be painful for us. <laughs> it's, yeah. For us, it's relatively painless. All right. What? what okay. So that's the fourth thing I have here. Um, okay. Um, what what is at least one do you have anything on your spreadsheet that says master facility ID? I can give you the master facility ID, which is um one zero three two eight three. Okay. What I'm gonna do then is just I, I wanna take a real quick look. Hopefully I haven't logged myself out. I'm gonna log back in. If I have, I just want to take a look and see, one, if you're a user at on that facility at all, and yeah, then, no, I'm <laughs> and do you know <laughs> if you need to replace Mark Feely, or is he still going to be involved, but just kind of more ancillary? I think the latter. The latter, okay. Yeah. Um, he can then stay in the position that he's in, and we can make you a registry administrator for the DIR, which means you'll need a user account for each facility. Um, you can uh, you can make all the variables the same, such as user type, user name. The only thing that would change. Well, actually, you can even make the passwords the same, too. It simply means, though, that you have to log out and log in again because the one variable that changes is the facility ID number. So mm -hmm. in order to log into that particular ID, you can use all the same uh, login credentials uh, because the facility ID is different. Um, it will require you to log out and then log back in again. We hope by the fall to have sort of this super user where folks can 
log into say their master facility and then have access to all the child facility data and not have to log in, log out, log in, log out. Right. So our development team is working on that too and so hopefully that goes very well. So <laughs> now let's see. We have a, oh wow, you've got a lot of physician users here. It could be that you have a bunch of them listed already. So what I might do is send you the list of what we do have and you can edit that list and send it back. Right, so okay. what I'm looking at is um, Hicks, Swirsky, March, and Goodman are, um, are, regist are registered. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are a lot that aren't. Okay, okay, um, that's fine. That's fine. I'll, then what I'll do is I'll just send you that spreadsheet and you fill it out and we'll make any small edits here if we need to. And okay. I am still looking to see, Lainey, what's your last name? Beatty. B as in boy, E-A-T-Y. E-A-T-Y. All right. I just want to do a search. You've got 35 users here. And I'd rather not go through tons of that. E A T Y. I'll just do a search. And if you're not there, you're not there. That's okay. Mark Feely is still alive and kicking. What he can do is add you if if you're not here. Let's so let's see. Hmm. Looks like you're not on the master facility. Okay. All right. Um. I will make sure to uh, CC Mark Feely. I'll, I'll give him the instructions to add you as a facility administrator. I'm sorry, registry administrator for each mm -hmm. of those facility IDs, and then we can uh, keep moving from there. Um, after this very long conversation, we can have another. <laughs> we can mm -hmm. set up another call, and then we can go through what does the data look like once it's been received here. I'm okay. hoping to maybe divide and conquer. First we can go through uh, how to get those, I think two, I think I think he said there were two new scanners, but I'm not sure, how to make sure those two new scanners are, are properly sending so that we can record your data. And then once we have the data, what that data looks like here. And I, you and your physician then can join the call and I'll make sure that uh, I don't struggle with the AV and, and your doctor doesn't have to go back to the emergency room. <laughs> okay. Oh, she's going there to work, not for her. <laughs> oh, I, I know. I, well, either way, it's kind of, right. you know, it, it does seem to be, you know, it is emergent. That's, that's part of it. Right. That's part so of her right job. Now, yeah. okay. That is part of her job. So right now what I'm going to do is just update the uh, the position to their NPI mm, okay. um, and then I can send it to you mm -hmm. and you can put them in the system. I'm going to check on those two scanners and okay. um, and then you'll send Mark Feely an email to make me right. a... Now what about the... Registry administrator. Mm -hmm. oh, what about the other information that I'm going to be pulling? Um, right, the so the what we can do is go through how to pull data from the DIR. Do you want to set up a separate call for that? Um, yes, I think so. Okay. I think so. All right, because then I can go through the different reports with you. I'd like to do it at yeah. the master facility level so that sure. I can, all of, again, it is unique to the DIR. All the data that comes from your facilities will go into the master facility first and then a copy goes into the child facility. Okay. So it's kind of nice to be able to look at it at the master facility level and start taking a look around at the data and see how it can be manipulated into different uh, graphs screen uh, and screens that are um, visual rather than just data. So you can take a look at that too. Okay. 
All right. Would you like to set up something? I don't know if tomorrow is good for you. I know it's Friday. It's probably pre-holiday. Do you want to get back uh, after the holiday? Yeah. Um, what do you think? Yeah. I think that next week, so my schedule for the next four weeks is pretty crazy. Okay. Um, I would I would like to um, meet with Mark and go over a few things before you and I reconnect so sure. I can sound a little more educated. Sure. Um, <laughs> and then we can, um, what, what does your day look like on Tuesday uh, the 30th? I can do an afternoon. I can do an afternoon on the 30th. Um, we have morning meetings. Okay, but I can't do the afternoon. You can't do the afternoon. Um, Wednesday, I'm no, open all day. How about in the morning? Okay, morning for me is like 10.30 when I'm actually alive. Do you... Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's okay. And that's um, fine. Okay, that's so fine. let's... I'm going to do that now. So I'm going to do the 31st, and then we'll set up a... a um, 10.30? Yeah, a 10.30. And I'm going to go ahead and build that out now so that I can I can put um, I can put you in it. And I'm going to put, uh, I think, Stephanie on there as well. Oh, here we go. That's not what I want. What is today? The 25th. You know, that's it, right. I think my <laughs> I have holiday on the brain already. <laughs> Okay, understandable all right all right I will I will build that out and send that to you for the 31st at 1030 I'm gonna block That's it great. off for an hour and that way you can um, invite whomever you need to invite and um, we can take our time how's that right okay. that would be great um, so that is for okay so an outlook invite um, and then this phone call, this recorded phone call as well. Yes, I'm going to, it takes a few minutes for it to convert. It's going to convert, I think, to an MP4. Um, and then once I'm able to convert it, I'll send it to you. It might be large, so I may have to put it in what we call a box and then okay. give you access to the box. You can log into the box and then download it from there. Okay. Sound good? Okay, that sounds great. So um, I'll talk to you on the 31st at 10.30. Okay, and give me a few minutes. I'm going to put together the things that we've talked about. It might take me about 20 minutes, but I will send you all the emails and we can get started. That's great. All right. I and appreciate I, it. <laughs> no worries. And thank you for being patient. No problem. I, no problem at all. I need all right. you. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank all right. you. We need you, yeah. too. <laughs> thank you. Okay. All right. I hope you have a great weekend. All right. You, too. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye.